The film that you're about to see was made by the staff at Honley Hamlet Station, part of the West Riding County Council back in the early 1970s. There was no soundtrack to the film, so some 40 years later, we're adding some of the stories that the ambulance men came across during their days of duty. The film was made to make the point of certain training methods and use of certain equipment, which at that time was very relevant, and a lot of it very modern thinking. The film was shown to every course that came through the training school. Uh, this went on to the new training school at Keithley until eventually time moved on and the film became somewhat obsolete. When putting the ideas into place in 2017 for the addition of a, an audio track, I contacted Graham Relton at the Yorkshire Film Archive, who now hold the copyright for the film. He provided me with a new digital copy of the whole film, along with a short trailer for the benefit of the Huddersfield Examiner website. He also gave me contact details for a couple of my colleagues from back then, Fred Williams and Frank Alston. They put me in touch with Brian Ingham and Jeff Todd, and without their help this audio track would not exist. My grateful thanks to them for their help and assistance. The audio track consists of information about the WRCAS back in the 1970s and about the making of the film. Interspersed with these, there are one or two anecdotes, no names mentioned, of incidents encountered during our time on the service. All these contributions are by Fred Williams, Frank Alston, Brian Ingham, Jeff Todd, Jeff Milnes and a rare recording of Clifford Lord. Graham at the Yorkshire Film Archive also sent me a copy of a document I had forgotten about, but was extremely surprised and grateful to receive. This was a sheet of paper containing a short resume documenting the making of Someone Needs Help, which had been distributed to the guests at the first showing of the film at the WRCAS Training School in Clackheaton. So the words you are about to hear are a blast from the past being written 47 years ago, when we were all a great deal younger, fitter and probably more optimistic. We're all better looking now than back then, but you'll just have to take our word for that. During the late summer of 1970, a group of ambulance men gathered together in the mess room of Honley Ambulance Station to discuss the proposed production of an 8mm cinefilm. The idea had arisen after filming of a demonstration by two members of staff at the village carnival, the result stirring the imagination of quite a few members who were state struck with penniless ambulance men. Realising the possibilities of such a project, support was rallied and the members swelled to around 20, each putting in a financial stake and, wherever possible, being utilised in the film which had a cast of thousands. Well, hundreds? Teens then? The first meeting over agreed upon were the incident, the actors, the finance and the date for the next meeting, along with the formation of two teams, one dealing with ambulance aid and the other one with the technical production aspect. All we needed now was the go-ahead for the use of a vehicle which was speedily and readily obtained. 
Two or three suitable venues for locations were visited, but the ideal site turned up under our noses. Right next door to the geese on land belonging to one of our own staff. Permission to use the land was battered out of the gentleman in question and things were all set for the next board meeting. The two sides gathered together under the chairmanship of no one in particular and prepared to do battle. Fortunately things all went well until it came to a date for the first day's location filming. One of the stars in question was on duty and with regret the cast had to be changed but we were working as a team and the star retired gracefully to accede to another 30 bob's worth of aspiring talent. For four men to get up at 7am on a Sunday morning, travel to the location, strip down to the waist, crawl into sleeping bags and stay there for an hour and a half must surely show how much enthusiasm was being put into the production. A break for lunch after three hours filming with a grand total of seven minutes film in the can but things always run better on a full stomach. More so this day, as the meal was provided by the landlord's wife, Mrs. Lord, seemed to give an enormous lift and we finished the day at 4.30pm with 25 minutes worth of film, including several retakes. Obviously things cannot always run smoothly and shift work was the biggest problem to overcome. A total of eight Sundays were used, out of which two were abandoned because of bad weather, along with three weekdays being utilised for indoor filming. The advance of autumn throughout the film acted as a spur on our efforts and after completion of the final day shooting, we graciously allowed the leaves to go brown. And all for what? The results of the takes of the unloading of the casualties was a resounding flop. Half an hour difference between two scenes left us with insufficient light and although we completed the unloading, the exposed film had to be very carefully edited, spliced, cleaned and thrown away. The 3rd of January was selected to have a final fling and at 10am the cast gathered together around a packet of Victor V gums in the car park of Huddersfield Royal Infirmary, daring each other to expose ourselves to the heavy frost in shirt sleeves. Things went well and although the shots are technically misfits in comparison of colour quality, the results were usable and have been included. We have had a lot of fun making this film. It has its serious side too, of course, in that some 20 ambulance men have put their experience and not inconsiderable time into this production for no apparent reason other than just doing it. Having done it, we hope you like it. Training methods and techniques over the years have obviously improved and systems have become different altogether. In the early stages, round about the time when we were making the film, it was quite common for an ambulance to arrive at the scene, two people jump out, back doors open, patient grabbed, put in the back, doors shut, crew back in the cab and off they went, back to hospital. That was the norm. Now, from then on, with further training and techniques of examining a patient, time changed altogether. In the early days, when we filled our job tickets in, if you were at the scene more than two minutes, questions were asked, what were you doing? Nowadays, paramedics can be at the scene for half an hour or more, doing tests and putting equipment on the patient. We hadn't got that far, but at least we had got to the stage where we were examining the patient, making a proper assessment, treating and positioning the patient accordingly, and eventually loading them into the vehicle and taking them to the hospital with the attendant in the back looking after the patient. When we got to casualty, control would have notified casualty who were coming in, usually casualty staff will be waiting at the door and we would offload the patient hand over to casualty staff 
and the crews were encouraged to pass any relevant information on to the nursing staff for the ultimate benefit of the patient. When we'd completed the film, with permission of the Chief Ambulance Officer, we decided we would have a premiere showing of the film to a selected audience at the training school at Cleckheaton. I remember quite vividly that uh, the place was full and I remember everybody stood for a minute's silence in respect of the station officer who had recently died who was at Brick House. I personally have been the uh, technical officer explained the reasons why what came about making the film and, uh, and then we showed the film. Questions were taken after the film and quite a lot of sensible comments came out. The completion of it all, we had a nice buffet laid on prepared by another Honley man, Colin Pickering and his wife. Everybody thought it had been a quite a good afternoon and evening. One of the things that I really liked when I first joined was the fact I was going into the village I was brought up in, moving people or people's children that I went to school with or grandmothers or whatever, and everybody used to natter away and they always said that if an ambulance came into the hospital, and everybody's laughing and shouting and talking and that, then they'd had a nice ride in. If they came in tight-lipped, then there was something wrong with the driver, you know. So it was quite, um, from that point of view, it was, it was a worthwhile and fulfilling job. I remember one evening uh, we were on a, a job. This was a maternity, but well, when we got there, uh, I'm afraid the lady was already crowning. So I said to her husband, I said, uh, why did you wait so long before you sent for the ambulance? Uh, his reply was, I hadn't got a 10 pence piece. Two years later, at the same address, I was called to a maternity again. And this gentleman got him in the back with his wife. This time it was all right. And he said, oh, uh, I'll just let you know she's having twins. I said, oh, have they confirmed it? He said, oh, no, 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 no. I said, well, how are you aware she's having twins? He says, of course, we did it twice. I remember one instance where we got this phone call from Huddersfield to take this discharge home. Uh, it was a stretcher case and I had to go from bed to bed. We sent a crew, they picked the patient up, took him home, took him upstairs, took him in bed, his wife gave him a drink and all the rest of it and we came back to station. Half an hour later we got a phone call from Huddersfield Royal, when are you coming for Mr. So and so? I said, he's waiting here to go home to wherever. Uh, I said, well, we've already done it, he's at home, he's in bed. No, he isn't, he's still here. When all comes out, we took the wrong patient and put him into bed in somebody else's house. And his wife said, I thought he looked different when you brought him home. You saw at the beginning of the film that crews often arrived on station up to half an hour before they were actually uh, due to go on duty. On one occasion, 
10 minutes before we were due to uh, go on active duty, we got a phone call from control to say that a doctor had requested a patient and he'd like him in the hospital within the hour. We signed on early and went off to the address that we'd been given. On arrival at the house, we knocked on the door. There was no reply. We had been told by the doctor that uh, the patient that had had the stroke, uh, he'd left him in bed and he was unconscious. We obviously went upstairs, put the carrying chair at the side of the bed and the blanket, went to get the patient out of, out of bed, holding him under his shoulders, under his knees, and as we lifted him onto the uh, carrying chair, he suddenly regained consciousness. It turned out that the doctor had given us the wrong address. We should have been at number 18, we was at number 8, and the person that we'd lifted out of bed was on the night shift at David Brown Tractors. Amusement to all, grabbed the carrying chair and got up to number 18 as quickly as we could. Now when it comes to an, uh, uh, an accident situation, we thought, uh, when people think of accidents, think of motor accidents, but uh, we thought of something, being a rural area, and we thought, well, what about if we have these guys camping? The idea was, we were going to make some breakfast and drink, and the stove blew up, and one got badly burnt, and the other one fell over a tent peg trying to rush around and banged his head on a stone and finished up unconscious, and it was a real emergency situation. Got all the kit out, the vehicles, and utilised as many of the training techniques as we could think of. We had the plastic airways, the put airways into them, and wound dressings, and used cold water from burns, and we used the, uh, the uh, sheet and poles for lifting and all this business. And eventually they all finished up in the ambulance and uh, off we went. Obviously we, we needed some training and training before 1965 uh, virtually amounted to a certificate from St John Ambulance or Red Cross of which you had to go in your own time to get it and in our particular ambulance service we got paid two and six a week for holding the certificate. Uh, to get the job you had to have a driving licence and able to drive vehicles a ton or over. The equipment we had in the vehicles, apart from blankets, pillars and usual things, splints, uh, stretchers, uh, we had oxygen, although we didn't have a lot of training on oxygen, there were no such things oxygen therapy in them days, not to us they weren't. Uh, there were some breathing apparatus about, but this was kept on station. I can't ever remember it being used. One of the campers that wasn't injured realised the, uh, the situation that they were in and they did need help. In those days there were no mobile phones, telephone kiosks were scattered around the areas and as you see in the film he ran off to try and raise the alarm and call the emergency services. First of all the nearest building, they had a telephone wire but there was no one in. He goes up tries to flag down a passing motorist who nearly knocked him down and eventually someone stops and asks what the problem is. They then set off to find a phone box. Nowadays with mobile phones and communications time is saved. Also the communications for the ambulance service varied. Certain black spots where you'd no two-way radio with a control in, uh, which was over in Bradford sort of 20-25 miles away from the area and there were black spots where there was no reception. The crews were aware of that and so were the controllers and they would have a rough idea if the vehicle was possibly in one of the black spots when they were trying to contact him.
from the end of the war to when we started doing our own training in 65, the ambulance services were numerous. Uh, they were run by local authorities and obviously there were different conditions and different standards depending on the money available. Each ambulance service came under the uh, Medical Officer of Health for that particular authority and it was up to him and how good he was with his committee just to get regards on what money we got. Uh, in our area uh, we had several ambulance services. We had Leeds City, Bradford City, Huddersfield, Dewsbury, Halifax, Wakefield, all different. And in amongst all those, uh, we had West Riding stations. Now, I joined the West Riding County Ambulance Service, of which we had 23 stations, which meant that compared to most ambulance services, ours was a big service. One of the things about the vehicles was that we're at the point of getting better vehicles and uh, vehicles that used to have an application of three times on the brakes and then you'd no brakes left were frightening to drive but then along came the Ford Transit and that really changed the way we were able to drive. We could go quicker, there were more stable vehicles, there were sweeter running, more comfort for the patient. think about it, they, they were no different to bread bands. They, they, they had no extra suspension, no, no just the ordinary old springs like the bread van had, you know. They were just a bread van basically with a, a stretcher in. So obviously uh, your rides depended a lot on the driver, knowing, knowing the road and being able to read the road as regards the, the state of the surface and things of that nature, as well as being able to maintain a reasonable speed. Our ambulance service in the West Riding, the chief ambulance officers was Mr. Bernard Whitaker, who because of the size of our service was quite established with committees national wise and he had quite a lot of influence with London and Liverpool big services uh, who already had some form of training of their own uh, and eventually we started off uh, with uh, a training school in 1965, it was a very makeshift job. Uh, there were no funds for it, it was sort of all done ad hoc. And Whitaker decided that we would have two weeks course for everybody, no exam at the end of it or a certificate. But that was the start. And then following that, uh, the outcome of the committees, chaired by a man called Miller, uh, decided that we would have basic courses uh, of six weeks length which would be done at regional training schools and would have a certificate, would be regi uh, residential and at the end of it would have a certificate known as the Miller Certificate. Now the national syllabus and designated skills taught were all decided on and uh, national instructor notes drawn up where every authority had to teach the same uh, level of training. If you didn't pass that course you were out of a job. We had lots of people come to training school who uh, were a bit long in the truth of the job and had not been uh, used to sitting in classrooms uh, and struggled and quite often failed. Following that we had refresher courses of two weeks every three years, again at training school which was residential. Uh, we stayed Monday to Friday coming home at the weekends. Driver training followed on from the point of view that people were conscious that we ought to have some higher standard of driving other than just relying on normal driving licences. So again at national level driving courses were set up with a national curriculum and uh, these were two weeks. All new people 
from then on were required to pass the six weeks basic for the Miller certificate and a two week driving course to hold the job. The instruction was given by driving instructors of our own services of which the original ones were trained at Hendon at the police driving school. The techniques were based on the book Roadcraft which was the police manual with the exception of the bit about uh, pursuit driving. The object of the course was obviously to make uh, the driver safer and speedier and more comfortable for the patients. En route to hospital, having got the patients on board with the attendant in the back looking after the patients, the driver had to drive to the direction of the attendant regarding speed etc. The crews were trained to make notes, pulse rates, breathing rate rates, etc. Any change in condition had to be passed on to casualty staff on arriving at the hospital. As this got more and more professional, we found that the hospital people began to take notice of what we were telling them. Attention to patient positioning and treatment of injuries in the back, this was termed in our case as ambulance nursing. Only Station, in the days of the film, had a total complement staff of 31, made up of uh, st one station officer, four shift leaders, shift workers and the day staff. The uh, shifts varied from night shifts where you started at 11 o'clock at night and finished at 7 morning, at seven o'clock the following morning, working seven nights and then getting three nights off. There was the morning shift that relieved them, they worked from 7 o'clock while 3 o'clock but usually could finish up working through till half past four or five o'clock even if a job uh, they'd been dispatched to was just before the time they were due to finish the shifts. There was also various day shifts that overlapped. Some worked eight, four, some came in at nine o'clock while five. And there was also one 10 hour shift where you did four shifts of 8 a.m. until 6 p.m. And even that could go to a 12 hour shift. There was a time when we weren't allowed anything other than a radio on the station and television had been around for quite some time but uh, the senior staff thought well perhaps it's not a good thing for people to think that am uh, ambulance men are sat in the station watching the television instead of doing the work uh, but of course we did our work we did all the cleaning and we were proud to turn out as fast as we could for the emergency and urgent work. So when we were allowed to have the television and the odd times we did have chance to watch it, we designed an emergency sign that sat on top of the television, in red of course, and that would be worked by a button pressed by the person taking the telephone call down in the office. And in actual fact we could turn out of that station in 25 seconds. Sometimes we did have to spend a touch of time looking at the maps because there's no point going blind. It pays to spend a minute or two looking at the various maps to pinpoint or at least get the best direction we can from a map before we set off. We wanted people to know that we weren't just watching television and if we were, we were out in a crack. And we actually informed the local newspaper who did an article on it so that the members of the public were aware. I started on the service in uh, 1969 and I was many, many weeks without uniform, running round in civilian clothes. When I was issued with my uniform, I was also issued with Wellingtons and a boiler suit. And I, I scratched my head at this and I soon found out that when you were on afternoon, you had the vehicles to clean and wash. And if you were on nights, you got all the oils to do, all the tyres to check, 
two vehicles to, to strip out all the all the equipment to clean. Um, on top of all that, we had uh, a station to clean, the offices, all the all the all the uh, upstairs, and all the garage, and uh, the boiler house. We used to have a coke boiler, which was to crease you with the with the fumes, but we still had to clean it. I do believe we were the only station in the West Riding with uh, hot water bottles which we used to put in on the evening and night shifts and put them inside the blankets and this used to be really warm if you've got a patient coming out of the house on a night. At the time of the film the vehicles were the old type of vehicles we might say and we didn't have 4x4s which would get us through severe uh, terrain or snow and ice as we have today and uh, the area we covered was uh, basically rural and uh, knowing the areas we knew we would struggle we used to call the council out and if it was something like a maternity We'd have two council wagons and a digger could be provided and they worked tremendously hard to get us to the, uh, the patient which was very much appreciated because the only other way was to get as close as you can and uh, get the shovel out of the back of the vehicle and shovel your way in and on occasions um, the next door neighbour looked quite pleading at you to uh, would you mind cleaning my path as well, especially if she was elderly? But of course we couldn't do it. Uh, although I did it at just the odd time, I cleared a step to make it safe. Coming from this, we decided we could do with something like a sledge. But a sledge, you couldn't really put a sledge into the vehicle along with the trolley. So could we convert a trolley into like a sledge? And we got our heads together and we eventually made two skis which quickly uh, located onto the uh, two wheels on each side of the trolley and a couple of the rubber bungees that you use on cars to hold luggage on were wrapped around the skis which had a, a hook at each end and we could fix one ski to the trolley and it could stay in the vehicle, located in the vehicle and then when we wanted to take it out, we just added the second ski. And that allowed us to navigate quite a few times. The fractured femurs, people had fallen, where they have to be stretched out. And it made it much easier. Because as soon as you start to lift the trolley yourself to carry it, you're in danger of slipping. And both the patient and yourself are at great risk. So being able to keep it on skis, on the ground, made it safer for everybody. Sometimes the pressures of the job got to you, especially after a bad accident. Trained people to counsel you was something that didn't happen until some 20 years down the line. And I once remember discussing this with Barry Robinson. Barry was also a part-time sub-officer with Home Firth Fire Service and had attended some horrific scenes. Years later, if they wished to talk things through with someone, they could have counselling provided by the service. We were reminiscing about our days on the ambulance service and realised that, although we didn't have counselling services, when we arrived and discharged the emergency at HRI or wherever, other lads from our station were dropping off outpatients or just having a cuppa after a run-in. They would have heard all that had happened, realised what was happening and we would talk all the way through the details of the emergency. We were each other's counsellors in effect. It really did help too. The fleet of ambulances based at Onley at this time ran both single and dual man vehicles during the day, Monday to Friday. Their main task was collecting outpatients and transporting them either to Huddersfield Royal Infirmary in Linley 
or to St Luke's Hospital across the moor, both on the outskirts of Huddersfield, but on opposite sides of the town. The patients to be picked up and the destination hospital were allocated by control in service headquarters at Birkenshaw and sent through to the station by teleprinter. Everyone hoped for the first run into St Luke's because there was a butcher's shop run by a chap called Charlie Alcock about half a mile before the hospital and he produced bacon sandwiches and pork pies like you wouldn't believe. This is only my opinion but no one has ever beaten the taste and quality even now 50 years later. It was a sad day when Charlie passed away. You are still Miss Charlie. Huddersfield Royal Infirmary had the main casualty department where almost all accidents and emergencies were taken. However, we also had several other hospitals in the area of West Riding which were specialist. There was a large psychiatric hospital complete with secure facilities in the village of Kirk Burton around seven miles away from Huddersfield and the Home Valley Memorial Hospital in the last of the summer wine village of Home Firth. Minor injuries would be treated but all the others were transported directly to Huddersfield Royal Infirmary. There were journeys to other hospitals such as Bradford, Leeds and Wakefield on regular occasions which would take the crew almost a full day. When they arrived and discharged their patient it meant waiting around, waiting for the clinic to finish their examinations or consultations with the patient, collect them, transport them back home to their own area. All vehicles were liable to be called for emergencies at any, at any time depending on their proximity to the any incident. Therefore, only ambulances were utilised in the Leeds area whilst on standby for bringing their patients back. It has been mentioned previously about telephone calls and the difficulties encountered. It will be rather difficult for modern children and some adults to imagine life without mobile phones and having permanent communication on the move. In the 70s, most people didn't have a telephone in their home as landlines were prohibitively expensive, so they had to rely on public telephone boxes. To give you an idea, I was 26 in 1970 and I was the first person in my family to have a landline in my home. Public telephones were similar to the ones today, but there were no card telephones, only cash. If you didn't have the correct change, no telephone call. Except for emergency calls, 999 calls were routed free of charge. The morning run into hospital without patients could start at the very edge of the area. Perhaps the longest distance away would be Clayton West, which borders on the Barnsley and Wakefield boroughs. Getting to the first patient on this run would normally be around 45 minutes and on the route to hospital would collect a further seven or eight outpatients. It could take anything up to three hours before the patients arrived at the hospital. If the vehicle was dual manned, one of the crew would travel in the back of the ambulance along with the patients. There were virtually no female attendants on the service until some years later, so this role was carried out by the male crew who would try and keep the patient settled during this long journey. Some were better at this than others. It wasn't unknown for an ambulance without patients on board to be called to attend an emergency if they were the nearest vehicle at the time, whether the vehicle was single or dual manned. They would arrive at the scene in much the same way as a first responder would do in more modern times, take charge of the incident, assess the situation in advance of the suitable vehicle attending.
we must talk about the morale spirit on the ambulance station. Most stations were very similar, but we can only talk about our own at Onley. The staffing levels changed very little in those days. People had worked there quite a while. We had, we had shift rotors whereby different people worked with different people. Consequently, everybody mostly worked with everybody sooner or later. We had a good station, we had a big mess room, we'd acquired a full-size billiard table. I remember changing it when somebody offered us a new one, I know it all had to be carried upstairs and it was a major job. Yeah, it went very well, we had a good social side. We had a wives group of which was quite well, well practically everybody, everybody who had a wife came, the wives came, they used to come and have their own evenings on station upstairs and they used to have close parties and different occasions to get together. Christmas we had children's parties where the station were full of kids. We even had the chief ambulance officer come and sit with the children with his paper hat on. We had quite, uh, quite some good social activities. The spirit was very good. I remember we had one ambulance man who was very ill and in hospital and he was moving house at the time he had to go into hospital and I remember the staff provided transport to take his wife to Leeds every evening to see him and at the same time other people went to the house and did decorating and sorting out for them. All this was done by helping one another, some people who covered while others did what they were going to do. We had a fund for petrol and things went very well. We had swimming, which uh, we started, started that at uh, the training school. I personally were a swimming instructor and a life-saving instructor. Lads were encouraged to go to the swimming baths after tea and we had the baths privately. And we did personal survival and Royal Life Saving Society awards, which again was well followed. In fact, I think we just had, of all the time we were at in, uh, swimming at training school, we had two lads that came to the school beginning of six weeks, couldn't swim, at the end of the six weeks, they got gold personal survival and bronze life saving certificate. The, the local fellas from Onley used to come to the baths to help because the population was changing, the students came and went. We had one fella, Frank, he was well known for being able to sit on the bottom and pretend to be drowning while somebody had to go down and get him up, which was part of the test. And then of course he used to struggle when they grabbed him which sometimes got a little bit out of hand. During the late 60s, early 70s, the station was given a piano for the mess room. Four members of staff who were musically inclined got together and formed a group, just like everyone did back in the 60s. There were four people involved, Alan Dixon on drums, Buddy Slater on double bass, Jeff Milnes on piano and Jock Gorman on acoustic guitar and vocals. After spending some time in rehearsals, they went out on an evening and entertained in Oak Folks homes in our area, which cheered up the residents no end, or so they said. 
For some of the members of the group, like myself, it was the first and last time they ever played with their instruments with other musicians. But it was an amazing feeling and we enjoyed every moment of it. Unfortunately, we were never given a recording contract so there is no audible record of our time together. Everybody seemed to get on well together. As I said earlier, we all helped one another and the job went on. When we made the film in the first place, it was made by people putting money in. Each driver put so much in. And having decided who were going to be the uh, actors as they were, we could only do it at weekends. We used to do it at Sundays. If they were on shift, then somebody used to come in and work for nothing so that they could do the filming. It was really, looking back, it, it, it was remarkable.